Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Aransa Sue Laskarine, and I am the Assistant University Director here at the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. Thank you so much for joining us for um, this webinar series on the, on the fourth National Climate Assessment. We commonly refer to the assessment as the NCA4. And we've been exploring the Southeast chapter for the past several months, um, one key message per month. And now we're very excited to be able to bring Dr. Bill Gould to explore the Caribbean chapter. The Caribbean chapter, this is the first year we've, the, the climate assessment has included the Caribbean chapter. And because our footprint here at the Southeast, CASC includes the Caribbean, um, we're very excited to be able to also explore this chapter with you. Next month, we'll be exploring the tribes and indigenous peoples chapter. Um, our intention with these webinars has been for you all to hear directly from each of the key message lead authors and the opportunity to have a Q&A with them at the end of their presentation. And we also want to make sure that the audience knows how to use all the components and the data within each of the key messages or each of the chapters. So I'm just going to uh, tell you a little um, note that we would love for you to participate in a quick poll that we are doing. You'll see a little pop-up box um, and we'd love for you to participate. This poll will help us know exactly um, who's on the call and from what agency or what organization. And it helps us to be able to better, better cater the information to you and those who are on the line. So please go ahead and fill that out. I'll give you everybody a few seconds to fill that out. Wonderful. <clears throat> Super, thanks everyone. Thank you very much. Um, there's still a little bit of extra time if you want to. Okay, the poll is closed, but I just wanted to say just a quick thing that um, so the majority of folks are from federal agencies and also split between local government, university, and we have a community member, which is fantastic. Um, and it looks like quite a few people have already been using the NCA4 uh, findings um, in some way. So that's really use, that's really good to know. Um, and, but we can do more to also um, spread information about how to use the report. So that's super helpful. If there was a category that did not best describe your affiliation, please let us know. And we'd love to add that category um, in our poll next month. Okay, everyone. Well, it's a real pleasure to introduce Dr. Bill Gould this afternoon. Bill is the director of the USDA Climate Hub Caribbean Climate Hub and a research ecologist with the USDA Forest Service International Institute of Tropical Forestry. He is a landscape ecologist with research interests in biodiversity, conservation, forestry, agriculture, land use, land cover, and climate change. As director of the climate, Caribbean Climate Hub, he has the opportunity to work with many of the USDA agencies in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands to develop and deliver climate adaptation tools and information for agency staff, farmers, and forest managers. He helped develop the U.S. Caribbean chapter of the Fourth National Climate Assessment, and the USDA Caribbean Climate Hub is currently focused on hurricane assessments, reforestation planning, and developing a wood industry and culture to enable sustainable use of forest resources in light of climate change. So Bill, thank you very much. You can um, take it away with your presentation. Sure, well, uh, thank you for the introduction um, and thanks to the, the team at the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. 
they have been great collaborators before the NCA, during and after the NCA um, process. So I appreciate being here and thanks to everybody for um, joining in. Let's see, hope the technology goes smoothly here. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I'll talk a little bit about developing the chapter, a little bit of background on the Caribbean region and then go through our set of key messages and um, hopefully have uh, provide some food for thought and we can have some discussion uh, at the end of this presentation. So as Aransazu mentioned, this, is the, this was the first time we've been involved uh, with a kind of standalone chapter for the Caribbean. There were a number of uh, the authors in this uh, fourth assessment that were involved in the third assessment and uh, some information about the Caribbean was integrated into the south, Southeast chapter. And the team of authors that we put together um, uh, really grew out of some history of dealing with climate change. And in particular, I wanted to mention the um, Puerto Rico Climate Change Council. It's uh, a group of 150 or so scientists and, and uh, managers and people interested in climate change from local and federal government and universities. And they've been very um, persistent and consistent about meeting and discussing what the latest uh, climate science findings are and how to communicate that information to, to the public and to decision makers. So in 2013, there was a Puerto Rico State of the Climate came out and it uh, assessed um, the social and ecological aspects of climate change, but also addressed um, climate science and the, the communications aspect of how to um, encourage people to implement adaptation and mitigation practices. 2015, there was uh, <clears throat> uh, the USDA Climate Hub um, developed a vulnerability assessment for forestry and agriculture and kind of captured some information that, that wasn't really in the state of the climate to a great extent about uh, vulnerabilities in agriculture in particular. In 2017, the um, Global Change Research Program developed a climate science special report and that contained a lot of the climate science on which the, the fourth national assessment, the volume two was based. And a number of the authors for the Caribbean chapter also participated in that climate science special report particularly some, some of the scientists from the Southeast Climate Adaptation uh, Science Center. And, uh, and then 2018, the, um, the fourth national assessment came out. Between 2017 and 2018, we, had, uh, we were working on the chapter and had uh, Hurricanes Irma and Maria um, interrupt the process a little bit, but uh, we, uh, we worked closely with the, the global change research program team and they did a fantastic job with our chapter and and um, with the other chapters about helping people uh, get to the finish line with these these chapter developments which are pretty um, big commitment for a lot of the authors so we started uh i i it seems so long ago now i think it was 2016 we had some stakeholder workshops um, where we brought together uh, scientists and managers uh, and let them know that the opportunity was there to develop this chapter and give our perspective and also the staff from the Global Change Research uh, Program their perspective on, on um, what the implications are of having a chapter, what the guidelines are for developing one, and get as much input as we can so that the, the end product from this activity is something that's useful uh, locally. And that was a key, key point of all of our stakeholder meetings is to try and make the science and the, the products that come out of this as relevant and, and useful as possible. A lot of the scientists have had the experience of contributing, providing science to various assessments 
and then really that's sort of the end of the process. The, the, the information never makes it back to relevant decision makers and stakeholders in Puerto Rico and in the U.S. Virgin Islands. So um, the task of this stakeholder engagement, the real task was to try and define the key messages for uh, the Caribbean chapter. And out of the group of stakeholders that met, a lot of them came from the Puerto Rico Climate Change Council folks that had been active in that. Uh, the leader of that, Ernesto Diaz, was the co-lead for the chapter, along with myself. And uh, we recruited um, scientists from the PRCCC, as well as from uh, folks at our institute and working with the Climate Hub. And uh, in the end, we had about seven uh, Forest Service scientists participating, five NOAA scientists, two from USGS, two from local government, seven university scientists, and four uh, individuals that work with private NGOs or uh, consultants. And this ended up being one of the larger um, author teams for the regional chapters. And uh, in addition to all those authors, we had some technical contributors and uh, three of the USGCRP staff helped us at every step along the way. And the, uh, the regional chapters um, have a, a, a format, so they're all relatively consistent. Um, and I, I wanted to mention also that a number of the authors also worked on other chapters within the assessment. So we were, we were lucky in that uh, regard because there was also a, a lot of interest in trying to make as many connections between regions and between uh, thematic areas in the assessment as, as we could. Um, so this, uh, this is an outline of the chapter. It's got an executive summary a background, a section on observed and projected climate change, and then a set of key messages. And we, um, we had some discussions with the Global Change Research Program about this section on observed and projected climate change. And we felt uh, it was important to include that because so much of the, the climate science for the assessment was based on work in the continental US and we wanted to be able to include the uh, relevant um, climate downscaling and modeling for the Caribbean. So we, we were able to expand our chapter a little bit and have that section on observed and projected climate change. And then each of the key messages, the, the idea is um, to articulate the links between observed climate and regional risks, discuss future projections, and discuss the challenges, opportunities, and include where possible some success stories for reducing risk, and discuss some of the emerging issues. So out of our, our uh, stakeholder groups, we identified six key messages, and uh, they're not in order of priority. Every time we discussed one, it seemed to be the priority, so they're, they're, all, they're all important, and they include uh, Freshwater availability, marine resources, coastal systems, rising temperatures, extreme events, and building adaptive capacity, um, particularly with international partnerships. So a little bit about the, the U.S. Caribbean region. U.S. Caribbean includes Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, population all told is about three and a half million people. And there are three inhabited islands in the Puerto Rican archipelago and four in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, in addition, there's, there's 800 or so uh, smaller islands and caves that's throughout the region. So as you can imagine, uh, the ratio of coastal land to interior land is high. Coastal issues are, are super important. The connectivity between the terrestrial and marine ecosystems is strong and evident in, in all the work with natural resources and, and research that people do in the region. 
the both uh, both islands are highly dependent on imported food, between 85 to, to 90 percent. Um, both are dependent on relatively centralized energy generation. A lot of that is in in big power plants in uh, vulnerable coastal areas. And um, there's also uh, there's also a a strong uh, if maybe somewhat hidden foundation of traditional knowledge in, in agriculture and farming and, and working with wood and forestry. But that, that kind of knowledge has been, um, it been on the wane. And I wanna maybe talk about that a little bit towards the end of the, of the presentation about the value of reconnecting with some of that, that traditional knowledge that exists in the islands. So I'm going to go through the key messages. Um, I think I'll I think I'll read them as they are in the uh, in the report, and then following each of these, there's uh, some some slides, um, some of the information that's in the chapter, some additional information um, for discussion about each of the key messages. So, key message one: freshwater is critical to life throughout the Caribbean. Increasing global carbon emissions are projected to reduce average rainfall in the region by the end of the century, which will constrain freshwater availability. At the same time, extreme rainfall events can increase uh, freshwater flooding impacts, and these are expected to increase in intensity. Saltwater intrusion is associated with sea level rise, and this will have an impact by reducing the quantity and quality of freshwater in the coastal aquifers and increasing variability in rainfall events and increasing temperatures will likely alter the distribution of life zones and exacerbate existing problems in water management planning and infrastructure capacity. So there's a lot packed into that key message. Um, nearly uh, most of the islands are, are very dependent on surface waters so the management of those waters is uh, critical, um, particularly when we're expected to see decreasing uh, precipitation. We have a, a couple of um, types of downscale projections that allow us to look at um, some future scenarios for uh, freshwater availability. Um, and to put it in, in uh, context, we have very steep gradients in rainfall that range from uh, less than a meter, maybe uh, 70 centimeters on up to nearly five meters of rain. And those gradients are, are consistent. They're governed by the orographic effects of the higher lands. Uh, they're, they're most steep in Puerto Rico and they can occur over very short distances of a few kilometers. And uh, if you look at the global circulation models, Puerto Rico is two, maybe three pixels. So you don't have much information about that internal distribution of rainfall on the islands. And for the smaller islands, they're uh, surrounded by ocean. So that um, ocean conditions really govern what you see in the global circulation models. So we've had two exercises in, in downscaling uh, global circulation projections, statistically downscale projections um, developed by Catherine Hayhoe. And uh, these were the first uh, downscaled information that we had. And um, they projected between 18 to 50% decline in mean annual precipitation through the end of the century with increasing variability and a marked drying trend um, likely to um, give us more, more frequent and more profound drought events. And in the graphic, you see some of the, some of the output from those downscale models. Um, if you're familiar with Puerto Rico in the northeastern corner, the, the red spot is uh, El Junque, um, where we get up to five meters of rain. So we looked at about a dozen um, global circulation models, and some of those 
predicted well the bimodal precipitation patterns we have annually. Some did not. And we tried some en ensembles with all of the models and some ensembles with just those that predict the bimodal um, rainfall patterns well. And then we looked at the um, different scenarios from low to high emissions. And so you see uh, even, even with low emission scenarios and the model where we looked at all the the ensemble, we looked at all the models, there's still an 18% uh, decrease in annual precipitation. And so those have, those have implications for all freshwater availability and everything connected with that. More recently, we've had some dynamic downscaling done and it's giving us a different picture which um, shows some of the complexity of trying to look at future scenarios for precipitation and get an idea of what to expect so uh, in this exercise, we downscaled uh, two different um, circulation models. And so we didn't have the range of circulation models from the, that we used with the statistical downscaling. And we compared in these graphics, the period from 1985 to 2005 to the period 2040 to 2060. And uh, Overall, the, there's a decrease of about 10% um, in annual rainfall, but you can see uh, the, the darker, darker areas, there's a greater decrease, lighter areas, less decrease. There's differences between those two models and they differ from the statistical downscaling that I presented earlier. One uh, area to note is the El Junque area in North uh, Eastern Puerto Rico with the high rainfall amounts. And that's an area where there's a lot of uncertainty about how um, local evapotranspiration and the orographic effect are going to um, affect uh, precipitation in the future. And the lower model, you actually see a slight increase in precipitation for the high mountains. So that's good news. The, that area um, provides about 20% of the drinking water for Puerto Rico and also harbors the, a lot of biodiversity in El Junque uh, National Forest. Um, we did some modeling with the statistically downscaled precipitation data. Um, as a caveat, that, that showed a little more drying than the dynamic downscaling. But if you, if you use those projections and do some stream flow modeling, um, you can get a sense of, of how much water we're going to have available in the streams and by inference in the reservoirs where the drinking water comes from. And here's an example of a, a combination of, of two of the bigger reservoirs in Puerto Rico and the darker um, line are observations for stream flow leaving those reservoirs and then the projected information about stream flow leaving is in the uh, the gray um, line. And towards the mid part of the century, if it's, if it's a high emission scenario a little before the mid-century, if it's low emissions a little after mid-century, we reach a point where the annual input is uh, less than the, the output from these reservoirs and they'll be in a permanent deficit. Typically we have uh, occasional droughts where we have to have rationing um, but for the most part, those re reservoirs have uh, more, uh, always have water available. So this would be a major um, change in the water availability for all kinds of uses in, in Puerto Rico in this example. So uh, I also want to mention something about the rainfall and, and cloud cover and how important that is for some of the key ecosystems in Puerto Rico. Um, particularly the cloud forests in the central mountains. Um, these are, are a, a source for a lot of the drinking water for the island, but also um, they have a high number of endemic and endangered species. They're often cloud covered, so they're, um, they're humid environments. And there's a lot of uncertainty about what the future might hold for the cloud forests. Um, they're, they're especially vulnerable to, to drying species on these uh, lower mountains that we have in Puerto Rico. 
can't migrate upward if the clouds cloud layer um, rises or dries out. So that's a, an area of risk and, and concern for us. There have been some modeling exercises looking at global circulation models and relative humidity as it controls cloud forests. Um, the uh, uh, paper by um, Dr. Eileen Helmer looked at neotropical cloud forests and uh, there's definite, um, the, the projections indicate a decrease in the uh, cloud forest zones with uh, decreases in relative humidity. And we also did some modeling looking at uh, life zones in Puerto Rico. And they're governed by both rainfall and temperatures. And based on the statistical downscaling that we did, um, the uh, rainforest life zones that we now have in the Luquillo Mountains, the three of those, will likely disappear by the end of the century based on that particular modeling exercise. So I'm going to shift gears um, to the key message two. Marine ecological systems provide key ecosystem services such as commercial and recreational fisheries and coastal protection. These are threatened by changes in ocean surface temperature, ocean acidification, sea level rise, and changes in the frequency and intensity of storm events. Degradation of coral and other marine habitats can result in changes in the distribution of species that use these habitats and the loss of live coral cover, sponges, and other key species. These changes will likely disrupt valuable ecosystem services, producing subsequent effects on Caribbean island economies. It's, it's hard to overemphasize how connected the marine and the coastal and the terrestrial environments are in the Caribbean islands. Uh, there's lots of uh, connections with um, economic activity, as well as with uh, recreational, traditional uses, traditional fishing, uh, lifestyles, and um, well-being for the people on the islands. And the, the two real issues, uh, two, two big issues are the, the warming of sea surface temperatures and the increasing um, CO2 and acidification, uh, and both of those have impacts on the real kind of keystone organisms, the corals in the coastal areas. Um, coral bleaching uh, is a primary concern. And just as an example, in, in 2005, we had a big bleaching event that affected up to 80% uh, of the coral cover in the region. And that was driven by just 12 weeks above the normal uh, local seasonal maximums. And so we're, we're not far from thresholds where um, sea surface temperatures can have a big impact on uh, coral communities. And there's lots of knowledge about the, the role that corals play in the biodiversity of um, marine ecosystems and the economic life of, of the islands. The graphic here shows um, the uh, increases over the last uh, three decades of CO2 in the atmosphere, um, increases in sea surface temperatures, and decreases in uh, pH. And so the ocean acidification also can have effects on, uh, on corals and, and all the sea life that that is um, uh, has has uh, calcified shells and um, these these uh, one point I want to make with this is that these effects of both sea surface temperatures and acidification can be exacerbated by other processes going on in the coastal zones and that um, reemphasizes that connection between terrestrial and marine environments so. Um, the coastal zones that are highly used, they're also, uh, depending on land uses in the terrestrial areas, you can have a big impact on water quality uh, and the um, survival of corals and other organisms in that zone. Um, this is one uh, kind of an example that we included in the chapter about things people are doing 
to respond to climate change. And there's um, some active coral farming and lots of uh, research and exchange of information between the Caribbean, uh, coastal Florida and the Pacific Islands about how best to do this, how to be successful with coral farming and also uh, research on um, coral genetics and how, um, how temperatures um, can affect different genotypes in corals and how there may be some um, ways where we can develop more um, resistant uh, coral communities in, in spite of sea surf, in spite of warming oceans. Key message three, coasts are a central feature of the Caribbean island communities. Coastal zones dominate island economies and are home to critical infrastructure, public and private property, cultural heritage, natural ecological systems, sea level rise combined with stronger wave action and higher storm surges will worsen coastal flooding and increase coastal erosion, likely leading to a diminished beach area, loss of storm surge barriers, decreased tourism, and negative effects on livelihood and well-being. Adaptive planning and nature-based strategies combined with active community participation and traditional knowledge are beginning to be deployed to reduce the risks of changing climate. So the, the coastal zones here and around the world are really a place where the rubber hits the road with climate change and particularly when there are extreme climate events. They're, they're concentrated areas for both biodiversity and also economic activity and where people live and where people recreate. And there are also lots of, um, lots of resistance to changing the way that we do things. So there's, uh, there's lots of ideas, solutions, adaptation practices that are, that are proposed and tried, but there's a lot of uh, inertia, I guess, and a lot of um, momentum towards doing things uh, at, with business as usual in the way we develop and use our coastal areas. So um, how, we, how we respond to climate change in our coastal areas probably will tell us how successful in general we're going to be in, in terms of um, mitigating and adapting the effects of climate change. So in Puerto Rico, the observed sea level trends um, have been over the last several decades about two millimeters per year from the 60s uh, up to 2017. But if you look at the last couple of decades, the rate of increase has gone up to about six millimeters per year. And um, so uh, that's, that's um, not unexpected given the, the climate projections. Um, but it's, it's concerning when you look at the, uh, how those rates are projected to increase further with uh, more warming, more expansion in the oceans, more melting of the ice caps. Um, I'm sure there's more to talk about in that coastal area, but let's leave that for the discussion. Uh, key message four um, discusses how uh, temperature is important and how natural and social ecosystems adapt to temperatures under which they evolve and operate. Changes to average and extreme temperatures have direct and indirect effects on organisms and strong interactions with hydrological cycles resulting in a variety of impacts. Continued increases in average temperatures will likely lead to decreases in agricultural productivity, changes in habitats and wildlife distributions, risk to human health, especially in vulnerable populations. And as maximum and minimum temperatures increase, there's likely to be fewer cool nights and more frequent hot days, which will likely affect the quality of life in the US Caribbean. So the, the um, there's lots of ramifications for increasing temperature. And um, we're uh, blessed in the Caribbean with, with um, offshore breezes and, and generally pleasant year round temperatures. So in, in some ways it's, uh, it's hard to sound the alarm bell about increasing temperatures. But 
um, there have been a number of, of exercises looking at the uh, ramifications of, of projected temperatures. And they have plenty of ramifications for the agricultural communities, lots of, and, and natural uh, vegetation. A lot of the um, organisms are adapted to this narrow range of temperatures. And so they're vulnerable um, when thresholds are reached of higher temperatures, they can affect their um, phenology, their physiology, their um, reproduction, uh, those kinds of things. Um, the, since the 1950s, temperatures have increased about one and a half degrees Fahrenheit. And the projected increase under the lower and higher scenarios, RCP 4.5 and 8.5, are, expect, are expected for both average and extreme temperatures. Um, this will lead to, and we already have evidence of, more days over 95 degrees and more nights over 85 degrees. The global climate models project about one and a half to four degree Fahrenheit increase uh, in average temperatures for the U.S. Caribbean by 2050. And the end of century estimates show increase as high as nine degrees Fahrenheit under high emission scenarios. So those are all very significant relative to the narrow range of temperatures that we typically experience. So here's a, an example of the deviation from the 45 year average annual temperatures of days greater than 90 degrees from a set of climate stations in Puerto Rico. And you can see that increasing, that trend towards number of um, days greater than 90 degrees, high heat days. And those are observations. These are some modeling information based on output from the dynamically downscaled uh, climate data that we looked at. And um, assessing the, the uh, high heat days, a minimum of one day a week with record-breaking heat compared to historical climate. So there's an indication by in these simulations that years could experience a very high frequency of record-breaking heat days, four days per week of uh, record-breaking heat days um, in the period 20, 2020 to 20, or 2040 to 2060. Key message five relates to extreme events. Extreme events pose significant risk to life, property, and the economy in the Caribbean. And some extreme events, such as flooding and droughts, are projected to increase in frequency and intensity. Increasing hurricane intensity and associated rainfall will likely affect human health and well being, economic development, conservation, and agricultural productivity. An increased resilience will depend on collaboration and integration planning, preparation and responses across the region. So this, this particular key message was initiated before we had uh, the big hurricane season of, of 2017. And um, that, that uh, we're still learning from those events. And um, they really brought home the message of how climate change is, is gonna be felt. It's not gonna be an incremental, uh, incremental experience that creeps up on it. It's gonna hit us like a, a, a hammer with these extreme climate events. These are some graphics NOAA now puts out the um, number of billion dollar weather and climate disasters for 2017 and 2019. And you can see that they're they're not always in the same place. Um, uh, there's variability in who feels the impact of these climate disasters, but the number of disasters is increasing um, in recent years. The lower graph shows the cumulative number of billion dollar climate events uh, per year, and the years that are in color are all the recent years, um, the top six or so from 2008. And you can see uh, 16, 17, 18, and 19 are all on the top of that curve. And these are all 
in adjusted dollars so that they're comparable. I want to share a couple analyses uh, of, of examples of learning lessons from extreme climate events and how we can um, feed that information back into how we respond to climate change. This is uh, an assessment of the combined wind and rain energy from both hurricanes Irma and Maria in 2017. Um, it's expected that this increasing hurricane intensity will affect human wealth and being, economic development, and uh, increased resilience will really depend on collaboration, better planning, preparation, and response across the region. And learning from each event is a key uh, element of that improved response. Um, so the two graphics here show the total amount of uh, wind kinetic energy that Puerto Rico experienced and the total amount of rainfall combined for both hurricanes Irma and Maria, and then the spatial distribution of those, um, those effects. And we looked at some analyses of uh, forest cover and, and impact on defoliation and how that related to the wind energy. That was one of the learning exercises we did. Another aspect we looked at was what we call changing the scenario, taking a look at um, the kinds of uh, energy that we saw in Maria and Irma and looking at some other types of hurricanes and, and try and get an idea of what the impact might be if we had, uh, for example, the, the um, strength of Irma took the path of Maria and went right through Puerto Rico. What kind of impact would we have on, in terms of uh, defoliation? In this case, we measured uh, and vegetation index as a, a proxy for defoliation. And we also looked at landslides. We did an exercise where we looked at the what if we had the rainfall from Hurricane Harvey and the path and timing of Hurricane Maria? How would that impact the, the degree of defoliation and the kinds of um, uh, extent of landslides? And, and so these, given the projections of more intense storms in the future, these are things that it's good to look at to get a sense of, you know, what if we had hurricanes of a certain um, extent? Can we use what we learned from real observations and get some sense of the potential impact of more intensive storms in the future. Um, probably the uh, second most prevalent extreme climate event that we experience in the Caribbean are, are droughts, maybe even more, more prevalent than hurricanes. Um, and uh, we, one of the exercises we have looked at is looking at some of the historic drought, um, particularly the 2014-15 drought, and getting a, an idea of the spatial distribution of that and the kinds of impacts that those droughts had. Um, in this case, uh, looking at uh, some of the, um, the extent of mild and severe droughts and how and extreme and how those affected some of the agriculture productivity in Puerto Rico. The uh, projections for rainfall um, indicate a, a likelihood of more consecutive days without rain and in combination with higher projected temperatures that indicates a likelihood of increased drought events for, for all the Caribbean islands. Okay, one final key message um, that we had a lot of discussion about and, and uh, wanted to include, and it deals with the idea of how in particular international collaboration can help build capacity for adaptation to climate change. And the message is that shared knowledge, collaborative research and monitoring and sustainable institutional adaptive capacity can help support and speed up disaster recovery, reduce loss of life, enhance food security, and improve economic opportunity in the US Caribbean. Increased regional cooperation and stronger partnerships in the Caribbean can expand the region's ability to achieve effective actions that build climate change resilience, reduce vulnerability to extreme events, and assist in recovery efforts. And I think this, this is one of those messages um, 
that probably resonates more strongly in island um, communities because of their their isolation from the continental areas and um, because of their size, because of some of the things that make them more vulnerable, um, their uh, dependence on, on imports and um, the, the Caribbean is a real mix of different kinds of governance, different cultures, different sizes of islands. Um, and they're all learning and adapting and experiencing um, climate change and coming up with solutions, overcoming barriers. And there's a real benefit to being able to share that kind of knowledge and capacity. But there's not always good institutional pathways to do that kind of uh, collaboration and sharing. So that was our impetus for including this um, particular message. Um, there's a graphic that uh, in the chapter that shows the location of research institutions, financial institutions, projects um, that are located on the islands throughout the insular Caribbean. And it's an interactive uh, feature on the NCA4 website. So when you, you go into that, you can see information about the organizations that are on that map. And it's, it's at least a start. There's really a, a wealth of expertise and experience throughout the islands and um, various uh, initiatives to try and foster that kind of collaboration, some more successful than others. Um, and uh, it, it's definitely an area that needs, needs some uh, thought and emphasis how to overcome, overcome those kind of barriers. Um, as uh, an example, um, a couple of months ago, there was a, a working group formed that was initiated by the State Department in a meeting down in Barbados. And the idea was building US, uh, building bridges for a more resilient um, future in the Caribbean. And I was able to attend that and it was amazing to hear not necessarily just the folks involved in climate change, but the folks involved in disaster response on large and small islands throughout the Caribbean. And there's some very um, com very uh, obvious common themes, but then there's also very unique situations on each of the islands in terms of their governance and whether they're uh, independent or, or have some connection with Europe or with the United States. And uh, the only thing that kind of keeps those sorts of collaborative activities going at that level are governments trying to help make that happen. At the same time, most of the adaptation practices are really grassroots and bottom up in terms of people making changes on the ground. So it's, it's a, a challenge to have things occurring both top down and bottom up in responding to climate change. But I think one, uh, one message of lessons learned from the recent hurricanes, the last couple of years in the Caribbean, are that there's really, uh, they, they need to be seen as part of a continuous cycle of responding to and learning from uh, extreme climate events. And that's a way to have a, a positive uh, outcome from these kind of experiences. Can we develop frameworks and systems where we quickly learn and we can feed that back um, into our pathways for adaptation? Um, I think this is the, the last slide. I just wanted to mention something about that kind of feeding lessons learned back. And I think uh, a lesson from the Climate Hub is how important it is to recognize that there's no one way to communicate, um, that you have to reach people with their language, with their area of interest, with their, um, with their preferred means of communicating. So it's um, the, the developing the climate science is super important, but it's one piece of the puzzle of 
communicating that science to people in a way where they recognize and get uh, have some some pathways to take some actions for adaptation. So I'm going. I'll leave it at that, and uh, hope there's time for some questions. Thank you. Bill, thank you so much for really an exhaustive and wonderful overview of the chapter. You all had several key messages um, and all very timely and important. Um, so I'd love to open it up to questions from the group. We have a good group on the line. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself or you can also type in your question in the chat box below and I'm happy to read them um, to everyone. Um, Bill, I have a question. This is Carrie um, Furness. Is that, I, I think that um, um, interactive map that shows these, you know, collaborating organizations in the Caribbean is, is a rich tool. Is that possible that, that uh, new organizations can be added to that as they emerge or other, you know, other collaborative partners in that? Well, I'd have to I'd have to talk with the global change folks, but it's definitely um, something worthwhile, uh, and it, it's something that takes effort. When uh, several years ago we did a compendium of conservation organisms or organizations around the Caribbean, and it was amazing how many um, grassroots organizations were involved in conservation and climate change, but it's they they have to be updated or they lose their relevance. Um, so that's a good good question and, I, and I'm working with the NCA5 a little bit. I'm not sure to what extent, but uh, that will be something to, to bring up with the GCRP staff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Hello. Oh yes, does it, someone have a question? Yes, I have a question. Um, this is Adriana Garriga Lopez. Um, I'm an anthropologist, and uh, I find it interesting that the um, what we could call traditional knowledges about forestry and ecology in the area are going faster than the actual resources that are under threat, like the the life zones in the Luquillo uh, Mountains. So I was wondering, uh, you said at the beginning that you would say a little bit more about the loss of that traditional knowledge. I was wondering if you could follow that up, please. Sure, yeah. Um, well, for the last several years with the, the Climate Hub, we have been um, trying to offer solutions about responding to climate change. And it's surprising how many of those solutions are not new. <laughs> they're, they're, um, they're best practices that, that some of them are part of uh, you know, modern agriculture, but some very traditional agriculture and um, I think some of the uh, some of the solutions that we need to to bring into the the conversation are are solutions that that come from traditional knowledge. And I think you you kind of see some similar conversations about the fires in Australia and how the Aboriginals manage fire. Um, I have a lot of experience working in the Arctic with Inuit. And they have um, they have their thoughts about climate change and how how to adapt and respond to it, and and I think um, that base of traditional knowledge in the Caribbean, uh, particularly in Puerto Rico, with such drastic changes in the 50s and 60s in society, um, it kind of got pushed to the pushed to the side a little bit. But it's still there. It's there in the, the fishing communities. It's there in the, um, some of the farming communities and well worth um, making sure that it doesn't disappear. Um, if not for any other reason, then, then there are good, good ideas and good practices about uh, kind of sustainable land management to follow. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. We're putting the, um, the URL to the chapter in the chat box. So if you want a direct quick link, it's right there. And we have a question here from Ashlyn Shore. 
Um, Bill, you mentioned that there are many new ideas for development and adaptation along the coast that hasn't received much support. Have you noticed a business as usual perception changing among the public with climate related events becoming more prevalent and visible? Yeah, we have um, much fewer questions about climate science and climate projections in our work with the Climate Hub. Mm -hmm. And we have many more questions about what, what can I do? What can we do? And those come from, from individuals, but also from agencies. You know, what, what should we be doing? Uh, and they, they come also from uh, inquiries from Congress. Mm -hmm. As an example, the, um, you know, the community block development grants, theoretically, <laughs> if they ever arrive here, will be a big uh, um, resource for, for development in Puerto Rico post-hurricane. And um, uh, there have been questions and inquiries about how to do that in a way that um, takes advantage of what we know about climate change and sea level rise and what to expect so that we don't make bad investments. Um, but there are, there are also barriers in terms of uh, the way um, rebuilding efforts are supported. Traditionally, green infrastructure isn't considered something that you would support as part of a, a development project. But lots of the, lot of solutions about uh, making the coasts <coughs> more resilient um, involve green infrastructure. You know, how we, how we use our, our coasts uh, and the uh, uh, kinds of habitats, wetlands or mangroves or, or coral uh, reef barriers, how do we use those to make the coasts less mm -hmm. uh, vulnerable to a, a storm surge and those kind of things. So there's, there's a, a lot of ideas, but um, they're not always sort of in that pipeline of, um, you know, so that they can actually get implemented. And, and we're, we've been doing a lot of work with reforestation planning. And just as an example, um, you may have some really great green infrastructure solutions, but if you don't have the material, the, the trees or whatever species might be necessary to make that happen, mm -hmm. and you have development projects that have, you know, they're on a timeline, they're, uh, they're trying to accomplish things, and there's a disconnect there so that they can't, implement maybe some good ideas just because the the material for reforestation isn't there and you kind of have to lift up several things at once in terms of you know making sure that that nurseries and greenhouses are aware of what material is good for certain kinds of green infrastructure mm -hmm. um, and then developers have to know that that resource is there it's got to be available at the right time and the right amounts um, those are sort of practical bottlenecks, I guess, to having uh, adaptation practices get implemented. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Uh, we have time for maybe one more question, and I, and I apologize for over overlooking. Dominique David Chavez entered an important question regarding, given that there's documented presence of indigenous and rural communities in the U.S. Caribbean and recent calls to engage more of these communities in climate assessments, what plans do we have for um, these assessments being informed by these uh, small commun communities and subsistence farmers and fisher folk who have been historically marginalized? So we've done some of that. Was some of that done for this particular chapter, um, Bill? And then in addition to that, how do we also here at the Southeast Cask do more of that as, as we do more of these assessments? Yeah, so we, we had some discussions uh, about how to, how to include some information about that in the chapter. Um, and there, was, there is also uh, a tribal chapter in the, in the assessment that addresses some of that. And um, I think we, uh, you know, there's, there's probably room for improvement in the next go around to address that a little more strongly one of the benefits of now having done a regional chapter is that we have kind of laid the climate science out there for the region. And we've laid out what, what some of the key issues are. And I think uh, a, a good suggestion for the next round is to include more 
um, positive steps and actions that are associated with these key issues that can help uh, minimize the risk and minimize the vulnerabilities. And so the, the issue of um, at least, uh, uh, first of all, being aware of traditional knowledge about ecosystems or practices or, or different parts of the landscape is super important. Um, but you have to, you know, you have to put the effort into making that kind of communication happen. Um, it's very easy for uh, people that work in the government and universities to all meet together and, um, you know, at a time that's inconvenient for regular people or working people or, or fishermen. And so often those kinds of, um, that kind of input is just not there at the table. And uh, I think uh, from, from the Climate Hub perspective, we have had post-hurricane lots of uh, workshops and, and listening sessions around the island. And that's been a great way to capture some voices of, for example, people that have been coffee farming for four or five generations, you know, how do they, what's their perspective on the hurricane? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and those kind of things are good to capture for an institution like the Climate Hub, you know, that, that is trying to develop solutions to, to climate change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. That's right, Bill. And I, I, I believe this was the first time this NCA4 that ha had these engagement um, sessions uh, for each of the regions. Um, I think maybe we need to re-look re at that and see how well those worked. I know, I think um, there was at least a couple for the southeast region um, and that was a nice addition I think in this NCA4 version but we need to revisit those and see how we can make those more um, more effective and more far-reaching um, especially those communities that typically don't have a voice. Um, so thank you everybody. I just wanted to share um, just a quick um, couple of slides with you all just in preparation for next month. Um, also just to say here we have um, on this slide here, I just wanted to point out to everybody, um, this is just a short list of the chapter authors. It was a very long list, but I wanted to let you all know that here at the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, we have uh, Jared Bowden and Adam Torondo, two of the um, chapter authors that are here loca located here at NC State to help you um, with any questions you might have about the Caribbean. Jared Bowden does uh, applied um, modeling, climate modeling, and Adam Toronto does that in specifically more for ecosystems and land use change. So those are their emails. And then I wanted to just to tell you real quick, when you come to the landing page for the NCA4, um, the URL is down here at the bottom, nca2018.globalchange.gov. On the right hand on the right hand side here, you'll see the report chapters and the downloads. They have two orange arrows there. That's how you can quickly access the report chapters and access downloads. So all the data that Bill showed, a lot of the graphics and data are easily downloadable um, on that um, link right there called downloads. And then lastly, um, the NCA4 consists of volume one and volume two. And then I wanted just to point out two important um, items here that may be of interest to folks um, in the Caribbean, and that is our Caribbean Oral History Project, which we co-developed with Bill in the uh, Caribbean Climate Hub. So take a quick peek at that. Um, the URL for that is on the study guide that we sent out. Um, and I think you'll really, really enjoy hearing directly from people that work on the landscape um, and hear their stories about climate adaptation and climate resiliency. And then on the right here, here's a, um, a landing page for the drought in the U.S. Caribbean. Bill mentioned drought quite a bit. And here are some specific um, fact sheets and data information regarding drought in the Caribbean. And the URL is down at the bottom there in red, but it's also can be found easily in the study guide um, for this chapter that we sent out yesterday. Um, so I just wanted to point out these two resources for you. And then lastly, next month, we'll be covering the Tribes and Indigenous Peoples chapter, March 25th, uh, same time, noon to 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 
and it'll be led by Rachel Novak of the Bureau of Indian Affairs and Casey Thornbrew, who's employed by the United South and Eastern Tribes and is the Tribal Climate Liaison for the Northeast and Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. So we hope that you will join us for that. Visit our website and also sign up for our newsletter. If you're new um, to the center um, and you're joining us today, please please sign up for, your, for our newsletter. We've got lots and lots of wonderful information um, regarding the Southeast and the Caribbean. Um, so again, Bill, thank you so much for participating in this webinar. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate the audience and their important questions. Um, so I hope everybody has a wonderful day. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Bill.